Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mamluks. I'm Mahi and I'm joined by my co hosts, Sheikh Amir Saeed and Sim. Today we've got a real treat for you. We've got Imam Abdul Malik Merchant, who was the associate imam at ISBCC, which, let me get this right, the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center. Yep. Right? Uh, Abdul Malik uh, graduated in May 2016 with a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies with a concentration in Dawah from Omokura University and is currently enrolled at Boston University in a dual master's program in divinity and social work. Um, you're here for the Khalil Center conference. Um, you know, we, we love Khalil Center. You know, Human's been on the show and a yeah. uh, good friend of ours, Molana Bilal. Mm. Um, what's your interest in the work they do personally that, you know, caused you to come out here for that? Mm. Um, so, Bismillah. Um, so, backstory, I met uh, Molana Hamza maybe four years ago. Uh, we made Hajj together. This is Hamza Makbul. Right? Hamza Makbul, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so before Hajj, we had to meet up in New York to do like some like Hajj group leader training. And I was telling like I'm interested in social work. I don't like I want to be an imam, but I really want to serve in the mental health pastoral care um, field. And he was like, you have to be um, Human and Khalil Center. And I was like, all right, cool. So when we end up making Hajj, um, Salim Patel was with us from Smile. Right. Um and he was like, yeah, you got to meet Human. I'm like, all right, cool. So last year, Human was in Hartford Seminary, uh, which is like an hour from Boston. And alhamdulillah, we were able to link up. So like my, my main focus is pastoral care and counseling, but I really, really love the mental health field. So um, it's a privilege to be able to work with them because it allows me to have an area that's already driven. Like I don't have to retread, untread and ground before because they already are doing the work from an Islamic mental health perspective. So alhamdulillah. Very cool. Now you're you're at a place a lot of masajid are struggling to find one imam. Right? <laughs> yeah. And you're you're uh with the top dog of your spot is Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. Indeed. Right? Who oh, is Oh Yasser Fahmi. Yeah. Love yeah. it, brother man. <laughs> Mashallah. So he's a Sheikh I'm to school with Yasser Fahmi. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Not knowing you that well, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you spent like what nine, ten years over in Mecca, yeah, right? Alhamdulillah. 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 And you figure at that point you're pretty qualified to lead a community, mm. but then you're just, but you've decided to like take a back seat to somebody else. Well, Alhamdulillah, I went before I turned eighteen, um, and so the nine, ten years I was twenty six by the time I graduated, and I realized that one, due to my age and lack of real life experience, I thought it would be unwise to lead a community. And then quite frankly, I studied not to, it was, I had a college experience. And so I didn't hit the books like Sheikh Yasser did or perhaps Sheikh Amr did. And I I benefited, alhamdulillah, but it wasn't to lead a community or be a mufti or anything of that nature. So I knew that I needed to be either an associate imam or youth coordinator, youth director. Unfortunately, there aren't that many roles in the country, but it just, long story, um, ended up working out that, alhamdulillah, I ended up at ISBC under Sheikh Yasser. And just a little, I I think... uh... Uh, when somebody uh, you said that he he kind of took a backseat to a, a secondary role, so a lot of times uh, people don't think about it that way. I think when they're in that position, they don't think about it. Oh, I'm taking a backseat. Someone that has uh, upper hand or a, a higher up than me when it comes to Islamic work. Sometimes, sometimes it's not like that, like it is in, in a regular corporate oh, world. Oh heck no! It's more like you know what I have to get my experience, and it's a responsibility. You know, and responsibility oh, sure. is a very scary thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and it's not, so I, I don't think the mindset even sees it as someone that's holding back in someone else's one upping them. It's not really looked at that way. I think. No, for me it was it's a blessing. It's a completely different paradigm. I think. No, it's for me as a blessing. I don't have to have the burden of ifta of giving verdicts on my neck. Yeah. I, I can easily just out Sheikh Yasser. He's our religious consult. Um, so the way the dynamic works is Sheikh Yasser is the, the mufti. He is the head of religious education and, um, Islamic rulings and everything. He does all the scary work for you. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> he does all the scary work. God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> He's your shield. <laughs> no, quite frankly, alhamdulillah, he set it up. May Allah bless him. Like he set me up where I don't have to do with politics. I don't have to do with Allah anything. Allah. I what just a really, relief. No, no, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. May Allah reward him and bless him for it. And so he deals with that side of things. I do with pastoral care and counseling. So Mashallah. more in the counseling aspect of things. Um, and the the light easier stuff like doing marriages and stuff like that. Sure. That's awesome. Do you did you have other experience or are you just kind of like a natural when it uh when you know like uh, counseling type stuff or so based ha- counseling? um alhamdulillah 
a year before I came, before I graduated, one of my friends was like, you need to get some practical experience. Yeah. And so I came home and served as a, they, the title was like junior resident scholar or something mm-hmm. like that at a masjid in VA. And it was just for like a month, month and a half during Ramadan. But I ended up going to Ta'lif in California and doing their Mu'allif mentorship program um, where I met Hasib Umair. I mean, Umair Hasib um, and some other wonderful people. And that's primarily focused on empathy training. Like, what mm. is empathy? And so that was amazing. And from then on, I knew that that's exactly what I wanted empathy to do. Empathy training. That's pretty awesome. No, no. It was, it's for... it's. It's really for community servants to come and learn how to sit in the red hot fire as um, as they were telling us, which is actually a biblical um, example. But to sit with people when they're expressing things and not be reactionary, but also be em- em- empathically listening to what they're saying. And that's so needed for, for the background that you have. One thing I realize is, and you, you definitely realize this because you're in this field now, is when you come back, 95% of the stuff that you learned is theoretical, unfortunately. <laughs> All the people that come to you, yeah. it's in Ramadan. In Ramadan, when people come, that's like a majority of the time people come to you and ask you questions. Yeah. They'll ask you about zakat <laughs> and about Eid al-Fitr, like the ruling of yeah, when they should yeah. give money and how yeah, and why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But majority of the, everything else is all social stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, Everything yeah. else is social. Yeah, and yeah, sure. alhamdulillah, it's, it's, it's awesome that, you know, we can uh, learn that uh, awesome information and knowledge, but... Uh, the reality of it is, man, it's all social issues, yeah, and it's, yeah. you'll be bum- everyone's going to be bombarded by it. And you're expected to know it, even though you don't have that training. Yeah, I'm not saying you. I never had that training. No, no. I, I was basically thrown into the water without having any training and eventually kind of just learning, yeah. calling it faith-based counseling for yeah, a while yeah. when I was at a masjid. But then you respect those individuals who, like, for instance, the Khalil Center. That's why I have yeah, yeah. an immense amount of respect for them. For sure. Because that's all they do. And, you know, they're still very, very tied up, and they yeah. lose sleep with all the issues that they deal with, you for know? For sure. Well, I mean, ISBC was amazing because after Sheikh Yasser had been there for like a year, year and a half, they understood that they needed an associate to sort of balance the work. And it was trying to figure out, do they want an imam or do they want a social worker or someone with like clinical training? Um, and then I came along who wanted to go into social work, but also had some Islamic training. So they, they really... Went on a limb for me. No, that's a beautiful combo, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best combo you can have. But I had no practical experience, yeah. like no practical experience in the job field or really in counseling. But they're like, you seem like you want to do it. So we all have some faith in you. And uh, alhamdulillah, it worked out. So right now, I'm, it looks like I'm talking to just the right people. Because at my masjid, I and a few other brothers are starting a youth coordinator mm. type of or youth mentorship type of a program. We don't necessarily want to count, call it counseling because okay. that can kind of yeah, uh, sure. cross into other people's uh, area. But what I want to do is I want to kind of pick your brain mm. in terms of people who aren't necessarily trained mm. with dealing with kids and <coughs> what's like a, a dummy's version of the best way we could get some training so that we can be better equipped to handle some of these challenges. Because right now, um, like I I've worked with kids in the past, like Sunday school and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of uh, younger students, but th- there's no really, uh, you're not really faced with a lot of their problems. No, mm-hmm. I think the Muzz is kind of envisioning uh, us being there as kind of elder brothers in the community that they can talk to and have some kind of, um, a, so, because a lot, a, lot, a lot of the elders in that community, they have immigrants, right? immigrant parents who can't really relate to what uh, their kids are going through. So, um, yeah, they're, they're looking for people who are kind of born in this country and now in their 30s and 40s and have their own kids and um, provide some mentorship for them. What's your is there a book that you could read about this? I mean, is it, <laughs> how, so, how do you get involved? In believe this? it or not, the Christian community has a lot of work on that. So the Christians got it right. Granted, yeah. they have a lot of experience and years right. and other resources that perhaps we don't have as a community, but they don't have, like most of our messages have one clergy member, one yeah. imam. They have multiple imam, or like clergy. And so like one of my classmates, she was telling me that she got paid like 15K a year just to meet community members. That was her job. She got paid to meet people. That's beautiful. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's beautiful. And so um, they've written books on this and there are complete studies on it and stuff like that. 
I don't know about setting up a program. Uh, that's not my expertise at all. But what I can say is one of the most useful things is really just seeing people. So like if you've taken Khalil Center's first responder training, after that, just being there for the kids. Wow. Okay, um, so what does the first responder training entail? I don't know in great detail because okay. um, okay. I we'll, haven't we'll taken get, it myself. Like, hum- on and, yeah. and yeah. then talk about it because this is something really important for – because – what I've been encouraging a lot of our listeners to do is become mentors and become like oh, elder sure. brothers for a lot of the younger Muslims. You can't you can't be complaining about the situation mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. of of young Muslims when you're not actively involved. Yeah. yeah. You know, one so- one thing that I do with high school students, which works out very well, is we've been a part of the system. I even went to that school, right? Um, that I teach at. So a majority of the somewhat counseling I do as a teacher there, even though I'm not supposed to be a counselor, but you know, you give advice is you get the students attention, the youth, especially the males, their attention very quickly when you understand what they're going through. And you're just literally just telling them what you've learned in life. Absolutely. And you're, you're making it very clear to them. Listen, I went through this and this is what I've accumulated and I don't want you to have this. And you prove to them why this is different. And then they'll fall in love with whatever you give them. So my experience with just my, I have two teenage daughters and what I've, what I'm realizing now is that they're really this disorganized in their thought. Mm. Like they don't really know how to approach challenges. Mm. Like it's all about um, their emotions are crossing in with how they want to approach things, and it seems like it's just like a mesh that they're kind of trying to navigate through. Yeah, um, and it's the age too. You have to remember developmentally. Man, that's uh, normal. Yeah, you know. One of the wisdoms of, you know, prophethood being at the age of 40 is that's when the intellect is fully complete, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a long journey and they're at that age anywhere from, I want to say 11 to 19, that is so turbulent. Yeah. That time is so turbulent. Uh, It's one of those things, something sounds good to you one day and the next day you can obviously, you can be easily convinced of something quite contrary to what you believed yesterday. Yeah. Right. It's a very difficult situation. And, you know, and on top of that, you know, they're girls and girls are much more different than yourself. You're a male as far as the way you think and you want them to think in a certain way. Um, and that may be a little more difficult, too, because females think a little more differently than males do. Right. Yeah. Um, so you have to take, I think, all those things in consideration. But what the Khalil Center, one thing, if I could just bring back Khalil Center into this is um, I know that Fahad is willing if he gets some dedicated people to certify them in first responders, even a small group of dedicated people, and even in more advanced, so he can certify them, so they can be faith-based to a simple type of counseling, and they're mm-hmm. they're willing to do that, but they need the serious people to do it. You know, mm-hmm. if you, I'm pretty sure, and I don't know if I should even be saying this on air, but if you if we can get, uh, um, you know, at least five to ten people that are really really serious, yeah, and not just driven for three months and then that's it. I'm talking about like for at least you know a year maybe, yeah, depending on how advanced you want to get, they'll be more than happy to, you know, yeah. and anything we we wouldn't be able to deal with just escalate it to them. Yeah, right. it's just better for Khalil Center. You no, know? indeed, indeed. I mean, as far as like. That's adolescence from, I think it's 7 to 19 or 18, something like that. That's the developmental age where um, everything from identity is trying to be formed. You're talking about um, there's differentiation that happens in who they are. They start taking risks they wouldn't take before. And so even forget spirituality. I mean, that's just the, where they're at. And But back to your, your question about like mentorship, like Sheikh Amr said, really just being there. Like yeah. seeing them where they're at, telling this, what my teachers taught me, my 80% of what I do is not because of me. It's all because of my teachers yeah. and mentors that have helped me out through the way. And so it's like, listen, you're new, like, for me, I don't really do with high school students that much. It's usually like young adults. Yeah. And so young guys just got married. It's like, listen, man, alhamdulillah, I got seven years in. That's all from Allah and also the help of my mentors. Right? Yeah. They saved yeah. my marriage how yeah. many times and my wife being patient with my ignorance. So. Yeah. And, no, and that statement that you make, one statement, which is a very, I think, a profound statement to youth, is uh, you tell them, like, I guarantee you within five years you're going to be going through this. Oh, for sure. And as soon as you say that to them, you have their attention. Yep. I guarantee you within five years this is what's going to happen to you because I've been there mm-hmm. and this is how you should deal with this. As mm-hmm. soon as you give them that stretch yeah, of yeah. five years away – then you have them in, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that's where they're ready to accept them. And they're really ready to be like, you know, then they're open up to you and they want you to talk to them in their language. Sometimes you don't want to talk in their language, yeah. you know, and you have to talk to them in a language, even if it sounds gruesome, 
then they're like, oh, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. So okay, that's now one I the, can trust him. That's one of the beautiful things at ISBC and specifically Sheikh Yasser. So before I came on, Salim was like, um, oh, Sheikh Yasser and Ashley were a thobe. And just me being young and burnt out from being in Saudi for so long, I didn't want to wear a thobe. I just had to re-find out who, like, who I was. Yeah. And Sheikh Yasser was like, no, be respectful and be who you are. Obviously, be professional to the job. But if that's how you want to be, that's fine. So I dress like this to work. Nice. Um, yeah. So like jeans and a button up with a kufi on topi all day. Nice. Um, but that really helps when we're talking about the youth. Because when I come in chucks or vans... It's like, why does the imam have those on? You know Beautiful. what I'm saying? And so that already is a shoe in to really connect with them. No yeah. pun intended. And it's not like something that I'm, I'm not putting on a costume. This right. is who I am. I grew up yeah. in the 90s. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. And I, I think you brought a really important point up and something I always talk to Sheikh Hamer about as well. The, the I, I don't mean costume in a pejorative sense, but mm-hmm. the, the get up of, you know, the masha, the, the sheikh wearing the, the juba and the thobe and all that, that's, it's a huge barrier and I'm not, I'm not dogging on anyone, but I'm just saying that in order to be more accessible to a lot of young people, yeah. I think we need to really get a little bit more relaxed about it. Um, I, I'm not saying. So I think we no, need I, to have different roles. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, the Heba, the respect of a sheikh needs to be there. Right, right. And we need people in our community, some big figures that everyone knows he's not to play. Like Sheikh Amin, like he's right. always going to be muhtaram and respectful and stuff like right. that. But then we need other people who play different, wear different hats. So yeah. like me, I have Sheikh Yasser. Sheikh Yasser always wears a jubba. Um, but I don't have to do that because that's not my role. Right. And so if certain people can wear that hat and then others can, Wear different hats. Yeah. Right. And and before people get a little uncomfortable, with, we completely understand the statement that you made. Oh, she- Sheikh Amr wears Thobo all the time, and me and him always is like go back and forth about it, about whether it's a good idea or not. And sometimes he wears a Thobo, sometimes he yeah. doesn't. Yeah, so, depending on the situation. And, yeah. and, and the, the reason why I respect that statement that you made very much is when somebody is teaching somebody something that they don't know. If a Sheikh is teaching someone information that they don't know and they have a certain get up like you were saying yeah and they're inspired by it one of the pushing factors can be or one thing that can push somebody away is they'll think man in order for me to be religious i gotta look like that too i mean i'm not comfortable in that that's it's just a mindset thing you know so it's like you said you're not being you're not being condescending in any way it's just i mean it's just we 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 we're very visual beings oh for sure you know and our culture is very visual too and look uh, at Sheikh Abdul Evans, man. Yeah, I mean the amount of young people who, <laughs> yes. who love yeah, his style. style like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that Shout is... out to Bela. Versace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think also we got to understand like the con- so if you look in like Chicago West Burbs or like North Side, like where it's like like Dio Bundy Mashaik, the the deal like the kids who are growing up there want it's like if they dress like a button if like okay let's say if Sh- Sh- Milana Bela rolled up in like a t shirt and jeans <laughs> like. It would like a, his youth wouldn't gravitate towards it. Kind of like what you were talking about, Abdul Malik. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, no, no, I think everyone. It's, like, it's all may, I think the youth may the elders. He may send a ripple effect mm, to the elders. No, no I, I agree with Mahin. I think there are some, um, especially in the Indo Pak community, there are people who kids have looked up to as they were growing up, mm. and I'm talking about from more conservative families. Okay, yeah, they they look at a certain image of what a religious person is, and they gravitate towards that. And when they see a guy, he's wearing a shirt and tie or a, a polo and jeans, they don't necessarily associate that with re- re- religiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, think about it. Like, like, like our buddy Mufti Abu Layth, right? You know, there are always people commenting how he dresses. And these aren't like old uncles. But right? you know what? With, it works against Mufti Abu Layth as that's well. That's what I'm saying. That's what, I, well, it, that's what I mean. It, it works against them because these youth, these people who are like our age, are critiquing him for how he looks. That's what I'm saying. Right, right, right. That's right. the point. You know. So I mean, look, we're, they're not. They, we're not working with a monolith, right? Yeah. You, youth means like a, a, a huge uh, percentage of the population. There's going to be different people with different varying opinions. So we have to understand that each job has a uniform. Yeah. Um, if someone were to pull you over in plain clothes, the first thing you're going to assume is like, what's going on? And then he has to show you his badge to prove that he's a cop. That's true. And so for religious figures, it's sort of the same thing. Yeah. I remember before I came home, I asked my dad, who's not Muslim, I was like, yo, how does a pastor dress outside of church? He was like, you wouldn't even recognize him. And it's because, but if he was to come to church in sweats, yeah. that would be a problem. Yeah. Right. And the same thing, if I were to come to the masjid in sweats, it's like, hold up, <laughs> like that's not cool. And yeah. so, because we have to respect the different roles. And so yeah. that's why, like Molana Bilal, for example, he can't just roll up like that. That's not cool. 
But if he's playing basketball, if he had like a court to own, I'd be like, come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, believe it or not, we've seen people wear kurtas <laughs> to the gym. Or, or even or even thobes like that it's are like good. tied god up into him. a knot yeah. it's all good god bless them but you know there's that there's that fine thing that picks with maybe it's just because uh uh you know western influence and we are in the west but um one thing that uh that i think about like i went to the message the other day in in my joggers and my sweatshirt because i was very comfortable in that and when i listened to recitation of sheikh nasr at ifs new imam there I just want to be very, very comfy. Mm-hmm. I just, and I don't want people to get the wrong idea, but sometimes I just want to be in the mesh with my pajamas on. <laughs> not, not in the sense that I'm undermining. I just want to be super, just homely. I super, you know, I and I, if I can just these, take, these are one of the bad habits we picked up yeah. from North Africa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say is that how do we, uh, and even is this is this idea even valid or is it a good idea? How do we bring the community to the level that um, religious figures, they're, they are religious figures because of their concept mm. and because of the concepts that they possess and how they lead a community. But they should be able to come to the masjid in sweats if they need to. Like, let's say, for instance, that you uh, are running late to the masjid and you don't have time to go home from the gym mm. and you're in you're in joggers and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. some some running socks and mm-hmm, running mm-hmm. shoes and you know like. How can we build an environment where people don't even have to think about the shell? Mm. And I know the shell is important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know the shell for a religious figure; it brings a presence. But how can we uh, uh, change the environment to the degree that everyone comes in and that d- we're kind of past that because it's the concepts that we know of this individual, his leadership qualities, and we don't care about the shell. And be- the reason why I'm mentioning this is, it's a human thing and it's a religious thing. It's a human mm-hmm. thing because we're very visual beings, yeah, yeah. right? And whether we like it or not, I remember Sim was mentioning this. When you see somebody, regardless, there is some type of, as a hu- on a human level, there's some type of judgment that happens. Right. We say that you shouldn't judge people. It's true. It's a cool, nice pop culture thing. You know, it's it's a cool, progressive idea that we always say, well, why are you judging me or why yeah. you shouldn't judge people? But there is a, a certain type of judging on a human because, level. That because happens. our minds are, are programmed for that. We want the quickest possible path to make a an assessment about something and we'll use our stereotypes and things like that um just before um the podcast started uh, brother abdul malik was commenting on my rings and he's like oh you know those are cool rings blah 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 and he's like by chance uh were you into uh, were you ever into rock and roll yeah you know i was like yeah i was and but it was a correct assessment. It was. He did use a stereotype, but it was correct. Yeah, of course. You know, but but so so that's what Look I'm at talking you, man, about. Look at you, man, coming here stereotyping <laughs> us, bro. What's <laughs> up? <laughs> I'm just joking. Stop. Don't we start a session. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about your experiences. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, no, I know what you mean. That's yeah. a beautiful example. Yeah, but I mean, we do it all the time. Yeah. And I think sometimes we get caught off guard when we are using it when... We judging race yeah. and um, talking course. about uh, racial stereotypes and things like that. And and the tone matters. Everything yeah. matters. You know, the yeah. tone matters, the timing, the place, everything matters too. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Um, but what were we but yeah, I, I was talking about just, you know, the imam coming in jammies, dude, or, yeah. or, or, or in joggers. Uh, well, right now here, the, the problem that we're facing at our masjid is that we don't have, we have like the religious kids, right? They, mm-hmm. They'll always come to the masjid. Yeah. But we're not having... Young people come to the masjid. People whose p- parents might come to the masjid and they'll have, you know, they'll be there for Juma and some events that are happening. But we're not able to pull their kids towards the masjid. And we're trying to figure out, like, okay, let's just be there at least as a resource where they can talk to. Maybe we don't have the facilities to have a basketball court and, and a gym. What and, age and group are you talking about? I'm sorry. We're talking about teenagers, you okay. know. Um, we just want, we want to be there. For some kind of counseling, mm. some kind of advice that we can provide them, some kind of religious direction in their mm-hmm. life, because we realize that there's all kinds of opinions and um, different ideas that are being thrown out, especially in social media. Mm. When I mean, it seems like every kid now is on f- three, four different social media platforms, and mm-hmm. we want to be able to, you know, make sure that they're getting the right ideas uh, about the religion and. Uh, yeah, just just be provide some mentorship, and we're we're trying. We're just struggling for ideas. And so one one thing one of my teachers told me before I came home was, um, we were, I was talking about the same thing. How do you provide programming that's authentic to the kids, but also is a conduit to actually helping them? And yeah. he was like, just open the doors. 
get some food, allow them to come in and allow them to be authentic. Yeah. And so not judging them. And obviously it's our religion has a part of it is judgment. Yeah. You know, we're trying to have Ihsan. We're trying to get better as people, but by opening the doors, there's some pizza, there's some soda and you're just sitting down like what's going on. Let's, let's just talk. Yeah. And maybe at first it's, and actually, so the way I presented it was I asked him, I was like, should I just read like a hadith? And we have a group discussion around that. And he was like, no, ask them what's up. Yeah. And I have found that that's some of the most transformative experiences. Yeah. So I, I, I was at mm. one of the colleges and we talked about marriage and I asked the presenters, I was like, listen, I don't want to have anything prepared. I just want to ask them what they think about marriage. And so I didn't come with any script and that's because I'm bad. I'm lazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just asked them like, so what is marriage? And they start going. And then from there, you understand. So what does our relationship mean? And then we unpacked it. And they were able to, I was able to guide a discussion, but they were able to come out with, okay, I, this is what I mean in marriage. And obviously, they're conservative kids and school and stuff like yeah. that. But alhamdulillah. Do you, you deal with mostly Muslim kids as your, in your chaplaincy work? Yeah. Oh, well, so alhamdulillah, I serve as the chaplain at Northeastern, though I'm not really there. So Northeastern students don't get mad at me. Um, <laughs> but primarily Muslim. But the way the chaplaincy office is, is that... I'm sharing an office when I'm there with an Orthodox Jew. And so he's going to serve the Jewish kids. I'm going to serve the Muslim kids, but we're both there. That's so cool. if he's not, oh, super cool. Um, if he's not there, then I will I may talk. If they're comfortable, it's all about the comfortability of the client. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. And uh, how much marriage counseling or premarital counseling do you do on a, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? So alhamdulillah, because ISBC is like the biggest mosque in New England, I don't do any. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. So I we, we took a training with um, with one of the organizations and just to get premarital counseling. And I made sure I did it with a couple community members. So there's a beautiful sister in the community um, who has an occupational therapy background. And alhamdulillah, she got married like a, last year or something like that to one of my homies. And she took the training with me. So because of her occupational therapy background, she understands how the mind works and how things work like that. And so she does the premarital counseling. Okay. And it's six sessions. They go through the um, Myers-Briggs. They go languages of love. And so that's where her thing is. Um, for me, some people ask me to, like, no, no, we, we would like for you to do it. Um, but I really don't do it unless it's a case like that. I mean, usually it's working through last problems mm. to get to where they need to get to. It's doing. not really like going through language of love and Myers-Briggs and all those type of things. Mm -hmm. Very nice, man. I want to talk a little bit about, so the other night uh, we had, to, I, I was fortunate to meet uh, Sheikh Yusuf Rios. I don't know if you know Sheikh Yusuf. I've heard of him. I don't know him, unfortunately. Yeah, he's a, you know, Sheikh Amr is very familiar with him. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he his whole thing now is talking about like crisis amongst the youth, mm -hmm. right? Like youth um, either like just being lackadaisical towards Islam. Mm. I don't know what your background is with Islam. You you, highly, you just mentioned your father is not Muslim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were you born into the faith or did you uh, enter at some point? So this is something that I use for my benefit. Um, I didn't. I converted, but I was only eight. What? And so with the uh. with the convert community, I'm like, yo, I converted too, bro. <laughs> but wow. then with the people that the the people that are born Muslims, like, yeah, I grew up across the street from a mosque. And so the story is that my mom converted when so my aunt converted. When my mom was eight, she's 10 years older than my mom and she got married and left the house. And my mom just grew up thinking she was a Muslim Christian. Subhanallah. So she believed in Tawheed or like theology, but she called it Christianity. No, she went to church for spirituality. Oh, wow. wow. So when I was five, she had me a daycare that was at a church and I came home one day, said, Jesus is son of God. And she was like, oh no, he ain't. And she <laughs> took me out that day. Allah. And so she started studying. And I remember her like reading me stories of prophets and stuff like that. And so she fasted on Ramadan for three years and she ended up converting when I was eight. Yeah. Now I tell people I converted because I wasn't sure. I was like, uh, I don't know about this. And you were still on your fifth row anyways. Yeah. So, she, so I was like, what do I do? She was like, go ask God if it's good for you to give it to you. So I made my little istikhara <laughs> at eight wow, years old. Wow. And I came a couple weeks later. I was like, I'm ready to convert. Dude, this is the most That's, unique story I've ever heard. That is amazing. <laughs> but dude. so my mom is amazing. May Allah bless her amen, and reward amen, her amen. and preserve with goodness in this life and the next. She, when she converted, she jumped all the way in. So within a year, we lived five minutes from the biggest local masjid. And then a year after that, we, I grew up across the street from a masjid. And so my mom would be like, wake up as Fajr, you're going to the masjid. Go walk to the masjid. And like sometimes it's like snow on the ground. I'm like, mom, there's a hadith. You don't have to go. She's like, you going. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she didn't play, mashallah. And um, so though I converted, it was almost like growing up Muslim. 
all my friends, we worked out the masjid. We played basketball in our complex. We went to the masjid for salawat. Um, and then so fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I was in a private Muslim school. So this is in D.C. area? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in the DMV, as we call it. Right. Um, Sheikh Saad probably told you guys about that. Um, and so the DMV is D.C., Maryland, Virginia. My parents are from D.C., but in 89, when I was born, there was a, a kingpin in D.C. So D.C. was really rough. And my mom didn't want me to grow up in that. And she moved us to Gaithersburg, which is like a half an hour outside of D.C. in the suburbs. In Maryland. In Maryland, yeah. yeah. And so when my parents divorced when I was eight and my mom, no, I was like seven, seven or eight, something like that. But my the reason why they got divorced, check this out. My, the reason why they got divorced is my mom accepted Islam. Wow. So she always told us that. I didn't believe it. And then like maybe five or six years ago, I asked my I was like, yo, so what's the real deal? Like, wh- why did your mom split up? Like, what'd you do? Like, <laughs> yeah. he was like, she became Muslim. And I was like, you guys divorced over that? She, he was like, she said she could, like, that was wow. it. So mashallah, my mom is absolutely amazing. So what a soldier. What, mashallah, yeah, really she's wow. amazing. She's still to this day. Allah Akbar. Um, and we're like best friends. When people see us together. They mm-hmm. think we're husband and wife. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, so is your wife going to buy those shoes? I'm like, oh God. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. So after she converted, she, we moved to Virginia, mm-hmm. um, across the street from Dalhidra, the big Mission Falls Church. So they moved from Gaithersburg to Northern Virginia. Practically, yeah. Right. So we went to Gaithersburg to Maryland for like a year, and then we moved to Northern Virginia. Um, and I went to school in College Park, Dar es Salaam Al Huda, mm. um, Sheikh Safi Khan. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. That's and so I would drive, my, we would catch the bus like an hour to school every day. Um, and so I was in that little triangle for the longest and used to eat at pizza roma too probably of course, of <laughs> course. I, so his my sister lives in maryland that's okay right. so the, um i'm friends with the owner's son he came up under me really you probably know my brother-in-law what's your brother can i mention his name on the podcast go sure. ahead gosh if yeah do you know him no no he's no. friends with the owner too okay how yeah. old is he now he's probably uh, 39. No, no. He's, dentist? No, I wouldn't know. No, okay. I'm only 28, man. Like, oh, on. my bad. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. <laughs> let, 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 let me ask you this. Like, as, as, a, young, as a young black kid growing up with mm. a bunch of, da- like, Daisies and Arabs, mm-hmm. right? Did you feel, like, any, like, being kind of the outsider in any way, no. to be honest? Really? No. Okay. Alhamdulillah, the Muslim community in Maryland, DMV, was really awesome. Um, and then I'm naturally like anthropologist sort of. Okay. So like I know about Daisy culture in and out. No, I know. We had a Sheikh Abdurrahman Chow on. Oh, I grew up with him. Yeah. 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 Oh, he, wow. he's he's older from than Virginia. Me. Yeah. 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 yeah oh, so, uh, he's like same, he's an Asian kid growing up with a bunch of brown kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. His, his, so well, what do you guys really think about us? Are we, are we as nutty as people make it out to be? As what? As nutty? Yeah. The Indians? We have no athletic you, genes, right? Oh, uh, uh, uh. Um, so I grew up. That's where we got shafted, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh. My bad. <laughs> so, um. Hey, it's called a mad mum looks for a reason. I know. <laughs> and I had to, like, restrain myself. <laughs> so, um, I grew up not only in the Daisy community, Dalhidra was Palestini, Arab, and Somali. So I grew up with that culture, and then school was Daisy. Oh wow! And so I got all of it. Like in mashallah, the the the, the Ammu like would let me in the office count money with them. Um, and so they were really awesome. Alhamdulillah. Wow. But you were before. This was after the Mahad. The Mahad had already closed, right? No, no. I went to the Mahad. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. For like a a year, two years, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And then they sh- shut it down. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. this was like. Was it either immediately after? No, this was after post nine yeah. eleven. Um, I was like twelve or something. Because we had uh, Mobin Vadon recently. Okay, yeah, yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear that one. He just yeah, came yeah. recent, like a couple weeks ago. So me and Mobin went to him school together. Oh, no. really? <laughs> yeah, wow. he's a stud, dude. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Awesome. We went to, and he doesn't remember. I don't remember that. Uh, well, I mean, maybe I do a little bit, but I came home when I came home to work at that message that one summer. And he was like, "Oh, Jamal, do you remember me?" And I was like, "Uh." <laughs> he was like, we went to his school. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's crazy how you all know each other, like Mubin, and, and we had Abdul Malik Ryan, and mm. um, like it seems like uh, Akbar Zeb. Um, Adil Zeb. Adil Zeb. Adil Zeb. These are chaplains you're just rambling <laughs> off right now. Akbar Zeb is one of our fans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think about a lot of the Mashaikh, especially like old school guys? Um, I don't want to call anyone specifically, but they, they say speci- that their argument is that. A lot of the chaplaincy work has become patty cakes with a lot of the youth. Like, we're not really being forceful with our message um, of Islam. We're, we're really 
um, we're too lenient in many ways and uh, we're not giving them a reason to change and come to the religion. But there's a reason for that statement, though. uh, Can you explain a little bit of background on that statement? Because it sounds a little general. Well, there's a reason why you're saying that, right? Well, I know, like, some scholars have said, like, you know, kids wearing tight jeans and, you know, ridiculous uh, un-Islamic attire when they come to the masjid. And, you know, there's uh, there's people at the masjid who want to tolerate that. And um, why why should we tolerate that? We should actually tell that person that, hey, you know, uh, this is not how the, the way a Muslim dresses and... You know, we, we should be more, um, we should take on an approach that is, I don't want to say. Uh, the, the, reason why the reason why I asked you that is sure. because the, the, yeah. the concept that is actually there is we accept people for who they are, right? Exactly. But there's a certain boundary in that too. That's what you're trying to say. Well, when you come to a masjid, you, you, there should be proper attire, right? There, I mean, there should be, a, yeah, there should, be, but, but what I'm talking about is even on maybe more molecular than that is that um, if somebody's actually doing something blatantly wrong, yeah. There is a tendency of uh, sometimes, you know what, as long as they're Muslim, uh, that's all that counts. Just let them do We don't want to push them away. It kind of starts from that mindset from Mashiach sometimes, right? Right. That's what you're saying. So now it's kind of become prevalent now until it's, it's well, especially a snowball effect that's gotten kind of the big. The criticism specifically towards chaplaincy work is that they've kind of taken it to another level. And I'm not so sure because I'm not, I haven't been involved in chaplaincy or I haven't really... I sat down and really studied it, but I've heard it a couple times, and I wanted to explore it and see. You mean, uh, are you talking about kind of sugar coating level, yeah, like sugar, sugar coating, coating is not too being, much? Not necessarily even sugar coating, but not really um, telling people to change their pattern of behavior um, mm. and trying to get them to do it on their own. But um, that is actually important. Sometimes you have to tell people they have to change, right? Yeah. So I think I can't speak to chaplains. I I know me. I don't know what anyone else is doing. Right. I think that something is very important with regards to chaplaincy is like you were mentioning, Sheikh Amr, meeting people where they're at. And so there's a difference between saying it's okay to wear skinny jeans as a guy because it's not. Uh, <laughs> can I lean into the mic some more? It's not. No, <laughs> for multiple reasons. Um, there's one thing to be like, it's okay to do something that's haram. And there's another thing to say, well, why are you doing this? Let's unpack it. Let's understand what's going on. And then in that, there's some spiritual counseling that's going on. We're trying to help you get to a better place. So I'll have girls come to me, ask me for dating advice. Like in the masjid, Imam, my boyfriend's doing this, doing that. And it's like, okay, this guy doesn't sound like a good guy for you. And then she's like, well, I feel like I'm doing something haram. Well, Islamically, you are. I'm not judging you. See, there's a big difference in me yeah. judging someone and then me saying, well, this is the reality, the situation, what Islam says. I mean, why would, I'm just trying to come from a devil's advocate perspective mm-hmm. and I'm just going to give you a hard time just That's fine. for the sake of engagement. I'll um, never like you again. <laughs> <laughs> but why would you even engage in that kind of dialogue, Mr. Merchant? <laughs> <laughs> She's doing something haram. You should say, I can't participate in this type of dialogue with you because what you're doing it's completely antithetical to my beliefs, and you should stop immediately, and we'll work towards something. Um, we'll try to get you married. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on here, Shane. I don't want to get married. Who wants to get married now? I'm well, young. Well, for many practical reasons. One, alhamdulillah, she's coming to the masjid asking for advice. Right. Yeah. And two, by not being confronted with... Um, I don't think it's hikmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says... For, um, uh, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي أَحْسَنُ oh, What's the ayah? Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad اِدْعُ لَسَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِذِتِ الْحَسْنَةِ وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي أَحْسَنُ Call to the way of your Lord um, اِدْعُ لَسَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْ uh, اِدْعُ لَسَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِذِ With wisdom and good reminders and, then, and argue with them with that which is best yeah. So I have to have hikmah when I'm dealing with her Me right. doing that is going to scare her away from the deen yeah. Like she may not practice anymore. So I got to have wisdom. I'm going to answer her question. At the same time, I'm not quote unquote sugarcoating. I'm telling her this is impermissible. Right. It's not like you're saying, hey, you know what? I know another guy that's better for you today. It's not like you're doing that. No, heck first no. Of all, yeah, first of all, no. So uh, I, I think I think that's a very, very important point. She came to the masjid. No. And, and she f- could have gone anywhere else. She could have exactly. went to one of her girlfriends. Exactly. She could have went to some other dude. Exactly. That would probably try to take advantage of her. Exactly. She could have went anywhere else. She could have went to some dating website. She yeah. But and from she that. Masjid, which means she's that there's a plant to see exactly. the there. And from that, part of our conversation was, I, I want to do more. 
It's okay. We have a class. Bismillah, come. Yeah. And now she's coming to more classes. Once they're in the doors, that's the it. possibilities are endless, man. Yeah. That's and why it's it, important to have If a lot she of... decides she wants to get married and she decides that we have a matrimonial service at our masjid, Ahlan wa Zahlan, we'll sign you up and I have a team that runs it. They're amazing. They will help find you someone based on what you're looking for. Right? That's a true community. Do you help with really. polygamy? Hmm? No, we do you not. help with polygamy? <laughs> no. <laughs> the question and the answer will also. No. You have to get a marriage license in order to get married at the ISPC. Mm, Indeed. I see. Yeah. He's uh, our uh, promoter of uh, any guest that comes on, even if it has to do with, uh, I don't like know. Like jihad. <laughs> <laughs> even if it even has to do with IT, he'll ask them about polygamy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that people should make sure they're taking care of their first wife. So that's a big problem, a big problem in certain Mem- parts of our community we'll just say that <laughs> <laughs> because one we don't have the cultural awareness and how to deal with one wife let alone two mm-hmm. how many of us grew up without our fathers um and so if you haven't grown up seeing a healthy marriage then you're still struggling to figure out one two we don't have the finances to do that now i'm not saying it's not it's not a part of our dean i'm not saying that people can't do it but the reality is 80 75 percent of our community is not ready to have a healthy situation this is supposed to help our community a healthy first situation a healthy first situation yeah. let alone we're not even get to the fiqh aspect of it's it's illegal it's so yeah yeah and and, and one of our guests he mentioned something beautiful um he said that if you're trying to one of the reasons why you shouldn't look for a second marriage is if you're trying to uh, uh solve the problems or run away from the problems of the first marriage oh yeah that's that's it's pretty dangerous you're setting marriage. yourself up yeah, for failure yeah, yeah, yeah. let's it's, it's responsibility the, the problem is and i'm gonna go hard on my millennials um we're so we're in the like the microwave age. No. We're in there are books written on this generation me, um, and the narcissistic epidemic. Like this is the age that we grow in. We're so entitled. But like think about our parents, our grandparents, how it took so long to make food. Even to make spices that grind stuff up and like there was no microwave. Well now is I want a pizza sticking in the microwave, beep, beep, it's done. Yep. And so that has permeated now into every part of our life. Fast food nation. Yeah. Yep. So if the marriage is like not working, well, why didn't she look like that? And why this man like and we as um Sheikh Amin said last night, subhanAllah, he said he mentioned the hadith that the, the Muslim is the mirror to a Muslim. And he was like, If your mirror is fogging, you're seeing something you don't like, you don't break the mirror, you hmm. fix your hair. That's deep. I was like, wow. I love Sheikh Amin. Man. Yeah, may Allah bless him, preserve yeah. him. I mean. Wow. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your experience. That, like, it makes sense. You, you know, I, I'm, I want to guess and just say you're growing up, you're 18, you're like, I want to go study Islam. Right? Nope, that was nope. Mom Dukes again. Really? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I homeschooled for high school. Um, and I, alhamdulillah, I graduated a year early. I started community college and I came home one day. I was like, Mom, college is not for me. I'm going to become a steam fitter, which is like a, a plumber of big pipes, um, and join the union. Like a pipe fitter? A pipe fitter, exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to become a pipe fitter, um, and I'm going to join the union. I'll start off making 20, 25 bucks an hour. I got a 401k and part of union, so I always have work, and I'm young. She was like, not my son. <laughs> you want a college, boy. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really want to. And this is the first time in life she didn't talk to me for like three days. Wow. And she had me like speak to all the different du'as. It's funny, the first person she had me speak to wasn't black. And he was like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be a pipe fitter? Huh? To be a pipe fitter made a lot of Yeah, sense. he was like, yeah, you want to get married? You're 18. You want your own autonomy? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and then I was like, see, I told you. He's like, uh-uh, let's call a black guy. <laughs> and sure enough, the black guy, he was like, yeah, that is, listen, we need engineers in the community. We need, listen. <laughs> the dawah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and yep. So, um, so from that, she started applying for me to study overseas. And she, mashallah, she was sending a hard copy every month and fasting it every two weeks until they were like, listen, he's accepted. And then we had family friends there who I said the Mahad with uh-huh. who would walk in a hard copy too. And so they were like, listen, he's accepted. Stop. What's so, this? Um, did did okay. she apply mm-hmm. elsewhere as well? So when I was applying, we had missed the Medina deadline. Okay. Um, and so Omar Khura was, they had two acceptance periods at the time. Right. And so we we're like, are we going to, Try Omul Khura as much as possible, then we'll try other places. And I got in. Alhamdulillah. Oh, you, you tried Omul. Like Sheikh Amr was thinking about going to Imam University. Mm. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I remember that. Oh, wow. Yeah, things uh, changed, and there were everything happens for a reason, man. Yeah, Allah is. Yep, yep. So tell us a little bit about Saudi. Like we we were like kind of like shooting the breeze before the show about how your your commute in Saudi. Thir- like how was li- like living in Mecca. So my experience in Mecca is very different than everyone else. Most people come to Mecca and they're like, oh, it's so much hustle and bustle. I like Medina. Um, for me, it wasn't. I, like, I grew up in Mecca. 
um, I was able to grow up in a silo. There was no external fitan. Um, there wasn't, there's no drug alcohol use. There this was, was 10 years, right? Yeah. So we're talking from 17, almost 18 to 26, almost 27. And wow. so all of that was majority of nine months out the year was in Mecca. And so I learned finances in Mecca. I learned how to pay bills in Mecca. I learned how to have a family in Mecca. Um, so for me, it was really unique. Um, I grew up there. That is a very so unique ten years. That's it was nine and some change. Wow. I just say ten. No, but a majority years. of people that move out there, especially uh, younger individuals that are there for that long, they're there for work and they're there in Jeddah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it, we rarely hear about people like that doing. So we that say Mecca khair Jeddah khair. Like Mecca's <laughs> nice Jeddah something else, man. I don't know what to do with that. No, well, because you know, I, I, we we've had you know, especially we've interviewed other African American moms who studied in Saudi, yeah. right? And they're always talking about the, the racism that's like just rooted mm, in mm, amongst the Saudi. Mm. Nationals. So I was blessed again not to have that. One, um, awesome. I think because the coarseness of my, I had hair then, I'm going bald now. Um, but my hair is not that um, kinky, I think is the proper terminology nowadays. We just say nappy. Um, oh, you, you look at the Malcolm Red, Red Little hair? So I didn't have that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but because of that, I was able to pass as a Saudi. Okay. But also because, of, more importantly, I went so young. My my Arabic was very strong and very colloquial. That's so really I spoke like Amiya, Saudi, Macaui. Yeah, funny. yeah. And so people never thought twice that I was anything but Saudi. And so I was able to fly into the That's radar and have any problems, alhamdulillah. That's oh, wow. beautiful. Yeah. Man, it's so in- interesting how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like, puts people in places and they the whole world is telling you a story but someone doesn't experience that story oh, oh no part of it no that's awesome it, it awesome. was it was really truly amazing for me alhamdulillah like people always ask me so do you have any animosity towards saudi i'm like no i got what i wanted and more uh, i was able to grow up in a silo it's funny my dad one time <laughs> he asked me one year when i was home he was like so uh, son, do you, do you, do you interact with women over there? I was like, no, Saudi is a really separated society, blah, 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 blah. He's like, good. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, why? He, like, I wasn't married at the time. I was like, why? He's like, don't worry about that. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> was your dad a pastor? No, uh, he's in, he works in the church. I don't know to what capacity. Okay. But, okay. But my, his family, my whole paternal side of the family, my grandma sung in the choir and my aunt still sings in the choir. So funny story, when I came home telling my aunt, what I'm going to do at the masjid, like new Muslims, da'wah, pastoral care. Come to find out, she runs the new members part of the church. Mm. She deals with the new Christian members. And so we, I was like, can I have your new membership like workbook that you give them so I can like, Islamify this bad boy? <laughs> and so, no, yeah. It's really important because when you were even talking about the counseling thing, when I was thrown to the wolves and asked to start you know, talking to people about relationships or just youth or whatever... The first thing I did, I went to church websites, mm. and I saw some of them have PDFs you download oh, yeah. and like things just to go through protocol mm-hmm, to go through because mm-hmm. it's such it's so much older as a society yeah, yeah. As, as, as Christians in, in the society here, and they've done all the research for us. Everything they've books. I think to, was Rich Warren. I think his name is author. Rick Warren. Rick Warren. Yeah, yeah. yeah his purpose driven life. Huh? The purpose driven life. Yep. There you and, go. And yeah. just a secret to uh, uh, that I'm gonna put out there today for my uh, young brothers that want to give khutbas or uh, young sisters that want to give darses, there's, uh, I know, a few scholars that take chicken soup for the soul, the five, I think it's five or six volumes, and they just Islamicize it, hmm. and people love the story. Have you read Chicken Soup for the Soul? No, I've heard of it. <laughs> it's not, awesome. Really? Some yeah. of those stories will make you cry. Yeah. And a lot of times, people use those for anecdotes, man. It's a beautiful, beautiful set of books. And it, even in the khutbah for anecdote, it's very, very easy to use those. So where stories. can I catch your chicken soup and soul khutbah? <laughs> <laughs> I don't give those. Khutbah, I don't give khutbahs anymore. But those, those, uh, I've they I, kicked I, them out. Yeah, they kicked me. Yeah, <laughs> let's just put it that way. Uh, You're going to hell. <laughs> You're too mad. Hey. You're too mad for us. Okay, so, so I'm actually in in a these days. I'm at work. I talk to a lot of Christians about like Islam and Christianity. Mm-hmm. We discuss it a lot. Do you guys, as a family, with your Christian family members, do you guys have those kind of discussions, or is it pretty much like you? Know, everyone knows, like this is what we're in, and this is what, and we're not gonna like, call, we're not gonna bring that stuff up when we're ch- chilling or whatever. So yeah, we know we talk about it. Um, I talk about it more with my my in laws. So my wife is an Ethiopian convert. Okay. She actually was Orthodox Christian, or her mm. family was more so. And my brother in law is big in the Orthodox Church. Like he's part of youth ministry and all that stuff. So me and him, lo- I love to talk to him about that stuff and okay. like what they believe and like how much they fast and all that. One thing I know is about the Ethiopian Christians, though, they have a different flavor of Christianity, man. Oh, yeah. They're, I'll tell you, one of my friends. They're Salafi Christians. Yeah, yeah. One of my friends, 
he uh, he he lives not too far from here. He has tenants inside of his house. Mm. A bunch of bachelors living in one big house. Mm-hmm. One of them is Ethiopian, and mm. he's like, this guy gets up in the middle of the night. Yep. He wears this white thing, mm-hmm, and he mm-hmm. reads the Bible at night. He's like their version mm-hmm. of the Hajjud. Yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah. he's so devout. And I met this guy, mm-hmm. awesome manners. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The guy is like so such a sweet person, and this is what uh, my friend told me. He said, this guy has the best akhlaq I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, he the amazing. guy gets up almost every night. So, it's joke. You know what that white scarf is actually called? Huh. Nutella. Is it really Nutella? <laughs> Nutella? <laughs> You're joking. I'm dead serious. Allah, I wish you didn't tell me that. <laughs> He's going to the church now like, yo, I need some Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I had no idea. But that's what he told me. He yeah, said that yeah. the guy, you know, he's he always has a Bible with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. always flipping through it like how we use the, yeah, you know, yeah, like the Quran. Yeah, through. yeah. So when I went to Ethiopia, actually, it was during some Muslim, some religious holiday they had. And for the entire three weeks that I was there, we were across the street from this humongous, beautiful church. And so I woke up for Fudger, thought I was here in the event. I was like, get up, start praying. My wife's like, yo, it's not Fudger yet. I was like, well, I just heard that that's the church. They prayed every hour on the hour. Really? I'm serious. I'm serious. During this holiday, obviously it's not everyone, but they're encouraged to go as many times a day as they can. And so every hour on the hour, there's their like an event type thing. And this prayer, it's amazing. Jeez, Fascinating. I had no idea. How yeah. do the Christians in America, when they hear about these Orthodox folks... Do they even know about them? Because I feel like a lot of the Christianity here, you were talking about how pastors. It's not about that, though. I think it's more of a denomination thing. Is it? Yeah. Well, because you were talking about pastors earlier, right? Mm. I've been to a church service before once, and I remember. Why were you at church, brother? (laughs) (laughs) Should we talk? I I, I was supposed to, I was there to, like, debate the pastor. (laughs) That's even, oh, goodness. (laughs) Anyway, sorry. (laughs) Were you really or joking? Uh, That's why I was invited. But uh, the dude was wearing, like, a flowery Hawaiian shirt (laughs) and, like, skinny jeans. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know. So I was like, when you thought about the pastor's uniform earlier, it, it's one of these like maybe some more progressive, uh, possibly. Kinda. So tell me, what were you gonna say what was happening with this? No. So uh, what I want to really ask you though is this, right? I I I'm starting this. Did you eat bread when you went? No. <laughs> okay. No juice. No grape juice. Nothing. No grape juice. Was. <laughs> that's a Catholic thing, right? Or it could be Orthodox. I think it? most Christians, um, that's how they do. Well, communion is Catholic, but okay. to become like you, Jew, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like. When, I, when I'm studying, like, I'm involved in studying some Christianity now as far as, like, reading their, like, I read a lot of Dr. Bart Ehrman. Uh, you're probably familiar. I don't Not know if you, you know, but like, a lot of the stuff, like, m- my conclusion pretty early on is, like, I just don't understand how anyone, like, really buys this stuff. Mm. Right? Um, I- I- is that fair for me to say, like, because, and sometimes I'm talking to my Christian, like, so the Christians that I talk to aren't necessarily the hardcore, like, evangelical types, mm-hmm. right? There are people that have doubts, mm-hmm. right? And they're looking for answers, and they, they try to, and, but they're like, you know, they're thinking about, well, that's what I grew up with, so I didn't explore it first. Mm-hmm. And then we, we, you know, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, I'll find something that says, oh, for example, that we don't know who the original, like, authors of the New Testament are, mm-hmm, for mm-hmm, instance. Mm-hmm. They're anonymous. Mm-hmm. So you can't even tr- attribute the book of John the John. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, like, and there's no synod, what we call a synod back to Isa alayhi salam. Mm-hmm. So how can we say this is Isa? On top of that, the whole, the, the philosophy of the Trinity mm-hmm. and how it's, like, really, like, convoluted, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I, I, first of all, I always just want to commend you on how eloquently you criticized Christianity. Unlike last night, what you did. <laughs> I, 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 I should have heard. I, I, he literally you heard. He's like Christianity doesn't make any sense. No, 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 it doesn't make any well, sense. Is very nice. No, no. You, you just understood. No, no, he, I think he, he used He's like that stuff I, is whack. You got to be crazy and stupid to believe that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like everyone is like, and, and at be, that masjid be, we be, do be, we do a lot of like interfaith events and stuff. <laughs> and everyone like me, Sheikh Hamer, Summer, who's also a co-host, we're all like trying, sinking into our seat. No, like, oh I'll tell God. you why I was laughing. You know why? Because everybody knows how he is, hmm. and he can pull that off. None of us would ever do that. Yeah. Yeah. But he's the only one that can actually do that. No one's really going to take so, offense. So, like, uh, it, it's a like some of y'all may have seen it on Facebook Live. So, I'll, I'll address it now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hey, but hey, but but let's say if the roles were reversed, wouldn't we be so so upset if some Christians said that about our religion? not not in their space? I wouldn't. No, no. So what I would say is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, <laughs> You have to have wisdom when you're doing it. Yeah, there's no Christ. There were no Christians there. Though, well, the, 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 so okay, here's the thing. I th- what would you you wouldn't do that if there were Christians? No. There. Here's an uncle came up to me afterwards. He was like, he did, so some of your boys were like that was dope, and some uncles like I, I didn't like it. So I talked to him about it. I was like, listen, here's why I said it that way. Right? Number one, it's an all Muslim audience. If there's a Christian there. I'm not expecting Christians like like listening, trying to learn Islam through Mad Mum Luke's Facebook Live. To be honest, right? Yeah. 
we the Christians that we like. I feel like between Sim and I, we know the non-Muslims personally. Listen yeah. to Madman Lewis, <laughs> right? Because we work with them, and we, you know. So I told them like the pers- when I saw the ant the question, it seems like it's coming from someone who is like a high school student because mm. it's like someone who's getting on. Un- we're in Wheaton, Illinois. This is like the heart of Christendom it in is. like Illinois, and th- like they're getting beat. They're getting like. You know, you're cornered, right? Mm. And the Muslim youth have to have some kind of like izza or is like you know that confidence, right? And you can't talk about the the issues of Christianity in 30 seconds. So to me, that's mm. the most. That was the most. I like that context. I'm trying to get so that point what, across. What I'll say you, is, you were you were given real talk, unadulterated real talk, to to basically permeate through their soul so they get. Soul. And the brother afterwards was like, maybe we can do a workshop talking about this. Down the road, we talk about it more intricate and detailed. So what I'll say is that how we speak about other traditions, we always want to be careful about it because we want to show respect to their beliefs the same way we would expect that from us. Now, I think before anyone gets into any intra or inter religious studies, they have to make sure they have a very sound theological base for their own. I think it's incredibly dangerous to study others, especially the Alhamdulillah in theology school, to just jump into that without any foundation. I'm not talking about just reading books. You need to sit with scholars so that you are well grounded in that stuff. But even still, if you want to bring Izza and might to these young Shabab, the best way to do that is teaching them their Aqidah. And then I understand it doesn't make sense what other religions believe it's not supposed to ours is supposed to make sense and again that goes back to the first point of understanding what it is but i think the best way to bring might is not with sheer vigor it's <laughs> understanding what it is and and believing in it and so now we can have academic discussion on while well, i don't believe the way hebrew bible was developed because of xyz and islam answers it this way and that intellectual currency for me is tr- far stronger than just being hyped up on emotion. Yeah, no, but I, I, I get it now. I get why you did that. I didn't. I'm not didn't, knocking. Nobody, no, 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 no. But I, I, I completely understand it now. Yeah. I personally thought it was humorous for me, but I laugh at everything. But I thought to I me, thought I, like I wasn't trying to be funny. I know you were. I, I, I think it's like because I'm, I could tell because I, I looked at your face. I'm like, this guy's smirking. I saw you had a serious face on. Because I remember I was having a conversation with a coworker, and you know, I was watching them read this stuff about the new testament they're telling me one thing it was like oh john wrote the book of john and i'm like who's john so they look it up we're at we're at we're at work at our desks look it up john was x y and z but we don't know but then the we, the article says the most bible scholars don't know who wrote the book of john then it says no most bible scholars don't know who wrote matthew mark or luke yeah none of them knew and like, anonymous yeah. and then like you're watching this person like essentially who goes to church all the time learn this for the first time and I'm like, and I'm kind of like, isn't it painfully obvious? Like, are we looking at the same thing? Because it's it's not, it's not a matter of intellect for them. It's, yeah. it's an, a, an emotional connection, emotional belonging. You know, but not just that. It's like how most Muslims in our community are. Right. Exactly. Most of them, you ask them, explain to them aqidah, or, whether or, asma or sifat. Or, right. Oh, right. <laughs> no, but, but explain, see, I, explain I, why I, he. I know what you're God. talking about, but that's not. I don't think that's what he's talking about. Mm. Because what he's talking about is. What you're asking about is a capability of the individual explaining their deen. Yeah. But the evidences are there. That's why the, the aqidah mm-hmm. is the easiest part, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's the simplest thing to understand. But he's saying when you actually take them to their sources of aqidah, where they actually get their aqidah from, and they're supposed to be the disciples of Jesus, they never met mm-hmm. Jesus, mm-hmm. they never sat with him, they never ate with him, and they don't even know if they actually wrote that, but that's what it's all dependent upon, mm-hmm. right? So one of them is a resource issue, what you're talking about. You're mm-hmm. showing them mm-hmm. there is no resource Originally, yeah, I mean, it to, doesn't belong to, to, to be fair. I, I, Malik's point: Muslims need to learn. Like, I, I, they I, need to learn. But that's, I think, that's they, a different they, topic. They have, they have to learn. No, they have to learn because, like, Christian could come to like a lay Muslim. Yeah, you know. And I've seen some of their Christians' arguments. If you're a lay Muslim, you could get swung too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, totally. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Totally. We, 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 I think we live in a day and age when everybody has like, I have two daughters, right? Yeah, when we grow in America, I mean, we grow, we grow up in America. There's no forced religion. Like, yeah. I could raise them Muslim, right? But if growing up, you know, or they could easily make a choice for themselves when they're, when they're older based upon, you know, if, and so it's up to me to teach them the intellectual fortitude, yeah. right? At the same time, 
the Christians need to learn because most masses of Christians they're like, oh, that's all they know, right? But not just intellectual fortitude. I think they also have to have a sense of spirituality, con- spiritual connection as well. Yeah. But how many of us have an intellectual connection, but there's no spiritual benefit of yeah. it? Right. And so now sure. when you're faced with some grief, some anxiety, some depression, and you actually have to deal with it, and you can't find a connection to that, then you want to do like headspace and do mindfulness meditation, so which is completely secular. Or, or just take drugs. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's a very yeah. realistic option for yeah. most people. What I'm beginning to understand, at least um, looking through history and how like Islam like spread through many other countries and other religions as well, how like the, the Christian empire expanded and into newer territories and how those popular the populations of those uh, respective countries mm. ended up accepting the mm. that the held by the the state right mm. so as muslims in this country being a minority are we fighting a battle that cannot be won that eventually we will get assimilated um into the society um where we will eventually be the minority us practicing muslims um i think i think that, that that's in I always thought maybe someone may think I'm negative, but I always thought that is going to be the situation. Like we're a minority within a from, minority. From yeah, from, no, no. I from, mean, we'll even be oh, become yeah. even because, smaller minority. I'll minority. tell you why, and I'm not being a Debbie Downer by any means, but even from my teenage years, I knew that when I was starting to practice Islam a little more, and even in college, I saw Muslims around me, and I saw what I was practicing, and I saw how uncomfortable Muslims would feel if I wanted to do something. A general populace of Muslims. And there's only a select few people who thought were nutty were okay with what praying in public sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I kind of realized that even amongst Muslims, there is going to come a time where you're going to be considered a nut. Plain, I, I agree with Amr. And 100%. I'll tell you why. The general lay people now of Muslims, it's, I think it's just the way it is. We're a product of our environment. A majority of people will become a product of their environment. There's actually a study on that. After three generations, there's no ethar, no remnants of the original tradition they had. Yes, right? And our children's generation, you know, we are first generation. Our children are our second generation. You know, and, and that's why the, the, the story of Ibrahim, it can be done, the whole three generation thing. I understand that's very, very true statistically. Mm. But that's why Ibrahim alayhi salam is very, very important in our Islam. We cannot study the seerah without studying Ibrahim alayhi salam. The very dua that he made, he wasn't thinking about his son or his children. He was thinking about all until Yom al He's thinking that I want the people all the way, my great, 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 great grandchildren I'm never going to meet. I want them to be just as strong as I am. Mm. Now, that requires a monstrous effort on your side. I hate to say it this way, but it is especially, forget our time and every time. If you want, to, if you need to raise children, do you need to raise them on such a level and be intricate about so many things? And sometimes you feel guilty about it. But if you're thinking about your great, great, great grandchildren, that's what all, that's the only thing that keeps me strong with me. And I'm nothing special, but I always think about my great, great, great grandchildren. Are they going to love Islam like me? I like, I love Islam or my children love Islam. And, that I think that's a, a perfect gauge to have because what you and I usually think about is just our kids. Right. But have we? Can you imagine that we're going to be responsible for like ten generations of kids that are never going to see us? Mm-hmm. It, it's like um, you you know you ever wonder about the great leaders of Islam like Omar and even, even like Muhammad bin Qasim, uh, uh, Muhammad bin Qasim, Sulaiman the Magnificent, and you wonder like. You know, you're so wise and such a great ruler. Why didn't you make sure that your predecessor or the next guy that comes in line is just as good as you? And then you handpick the next three or four leaders and make sure that they're all like trained really well. And as much as you want, as much as you want, time, time, you can't fight against time, you right? You can't. And th- th- that's what freaks me out the most. That so, like, being a parent is not easy, right? Yeah. And th- but we have to realize it's an amana, and in fulfilling the amana. We have to try to make sure we're putting our children in the best possible situation we can. Yeah. And making sure that we're not just giving them Islam, like how you were saying, which is like blind faith, but how they love the religion and they're trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their practice of religion. But not just that, listening to them and being caring for them emotionally. Because what I found from whether it's my friends or my sister's friends, that no matter how religious the parents are, if they couldn't be empathetic for the children they yeah. couldn't be there emotionally that doesn't matter anymore 
then all that Islam, Hafid, Quran, all that can go right out the door as soon as they go to college. Because if, you're, if your kids can't connect, especially for like the first generations, but like if you can't be there emotionally for your children, then what else do they really have? And um, Dr. Haman was just telling me earlier about how, um, or maybe it was Dr. Fahad, Dr. Fahad about a client who wished their parents would even give them a negative response. Wow. Like, he's like, I can do whatever I want and they wouldn't care. Hmm. And so our kids and these things, as you guys talk about next generation, just like there's generational trauma, there's also generational things that you can teach your children. So like my grandfather and my grandmother got divorced when my dad was eight. So my dad didn't know what it was to be a dad. So now when my parents got divorced, it was mind shattering for him. He wanted, he loves us so much. And all of a sudden he's following his father's footsteps. So for the first couple of years was good. Things just didn't work out. Um, I was disrespectful, was, you know, <laughs> I was respectful to him. And then, so we stopped talking for a few years. So now I have to reach out. He didn't know. So what my friends will tell me from this situation is like, dude, you're overcompensating with your kids. I'm like, my kids got to know I love them because I got to break the, the silsila, the chain that's happened generationally. Mm. And we have to take the ownership for that. Just because we had trauma in our lives doesn't mean that I can just throw my hands up and say, you know, subhanAllah, I didn't learn it. So no, no, if you see things you don't like, be, have wa'i, pay attention, understand what's going on, and then try to make a change. This is an amana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds accountable for how we raise our children. Yeah. And so we have to be there for them emotionally just as much as we do religiously. And, and just to bring us back to your point, and we can move on to something else, but as it's something I just thought of. I want you to think about how you raise your children and individuals that you see that are like what we, you know, the individuals that may refer to us as alt Muslims and they think that we're too much about us. There's people that refer to us as alt Muslims. Really? All bros. <laughs> all bros, sorry. And, uh, and, wow. and you see them as progressives. You see them as they don't really practice and you see the result on the children. What do you think is going to happen to their children, the third generation of those people? What do you th- honestly, be honest with yourself. Where do you see their children? Because they themselves, their children, it's very, very, like, I'm not even just talking about prayer and stuff. Even the embarrassment and the shy of being Muslim and all that. Like, where do you really think those children, what's going to happen to their children? I'm telling you. I mean, I, I'm seeing a, a decline. And your children are going to be the weirdos to them. Right. right. And your right. Grand, grandchildren are going to be bigger weirdos. Right. To I them. Think, I think for me, look, one of the things my teachers told me is like, you just got to worry about you and your kids. Yep. Like what someone else's kids are going to do and what they're not going to do is like, God bless them. <laughs> well, fuck Allah. <laughs> May Allah make it easy for I mean, you. But I what mean, am I doing with my babies? Of course. Yeah, because of course. like, and then with that emotional intelligence, with being there for them, inshallah, they'll have an emotional fortitude and identity formation wherein they're they're comfortable in any society they, that's that's that i think that's the goal man it's that comfort because if it's not within the muslim community it's going to be the non-muslim community we live in america yeah and so whether they're going to public school they go to the mall they go somewhere they're going to face some adversity yeah and right. so uh, giving them that identity yeah. but that ownership of it then that's what different and i think that so, the so, general populace of people we don't i mean that's just going to happen you know and we just have to try our best not like we're better well, i'm not saying we're better than everybody else uh, I'm just saying that there's a general populace of, of lay people of what how things just work themselves out. And then you have a small group of people that try their best to hold on to something. You know? And Sheikh Amr, I think on top of that, you're like, it's amplified even more in like other cities. In Chicago, yeah. in like Abdul Malik's room, like, Abdul Malik's mom is like a one of a kind, mashallah. Yeah. But places like Virginia, back in the day, like Chicago, the Bay, like where there's strong Muslim communities, right? They have that support. But like I grew up in Ohio, so there was like no spiritual leadership there, mm. right? Um, so like, you know, that's kind of where most, the majority of Muslims in America are like that, you know? And then you, you'll meet a, a brother, like one or two out of like a hundred. Who were like on the dean? It reminds me of a. I, I remember I was at a wedding back in like 2004 in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio is pretty much like a desert. I mean, they have some old school brothers there, like uh, Lukman Williams, Rahimullah. I passed away like I think last year, but um, but uh, I met this Daisy brother. He was 16 at the time at his wedding, and it was with the guy. You know what the guy who it is? What do you guys call it? like the Mendy? Mm-hmm. I was, it was like the Mendy. Like I don't know how to translate that to you. You, know, you know what Mendy is? Yeah. Totally. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a, a he pre- lived amongst Daisy's whole a, a life. Pre-wedding. Yeah. Ritual. So at 2004, it's a, celebration. Um, uh, it was a bachelor party. Yeah. Okay. It was like early 20s. It was like bachelor party for the girls. Oh, then, yeah. It's a yeah. bridal party. Bridal, bridal party. Right. Oh. So early. Tw- it was like, but like men get to go too, right? And so like uh, I, I met this brother. He was 16. I was like 22, and like this brother had a full beard. 
you know, and he uh, and I, we talked about it. I was like, I could just tell he was like a dean and kid, and I was getting into the dean at the time, and so I was just like hanging out with him the whole time. And I was just thinking about, and we, we stayed connected. He ended up going like going through the island program here at Elgin, For and sure. now was like a imam, I think, on the east coast. Uh, but I, but I was, and I was texting from time to time because he'd always give me an iman like rush, so to speak, whenever I was around him. Mm. But then I thought about like I used to ask him about Cleveland, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, there's it's not really going not much going on here." And I'm like, "But there's like 16 year old kids holding it down. Like his dad is not even religious, right? He's not like surrounded by like a huge group. He's like, you know." And and that's but that's that, that's the reality. So in these smaller cities, it's, it's even I think more amplified. So I, so I'll, I I'll say three things to that. Yeah. One, it's an amana and how we raise our children. Yeah. So if your a priority of yours is to allow your child to grow up in a very religious or outwardly religious environment, mm-hmm. then put them in that. Mm-hmm. If that means you have to move, there's certain sacrifices we have to make for our children. Totally. Sure. Um, but again, that's on everyone's priorities. Right. And two, we have to realize that we don't know how we're going to end up how we will die and You're how right. they're going to die. And right. so we have to make draw for everyone and hope that we have a good end. Yeah. And so, and then the other thing is we have to think of the Hadith of the woman, the prostitute woman who fed the dog water. Yes. Mm-hmm. She was able to enter Jannah into that. And so because of those things, my teachers always told me like, we don't, I'm not here to judge anyone. And, yeah. and that's not a, and I'm not saying it from the new, like we don't judge each other, but you're standing with Allah. I don't know. Yeah. And so I hope the best for you, dude. But I got too many skeletons in my closet to even worry about that. Yeah. And so again, what's prior? My it's a priority for me that my kids know how to pray. So at four and two, we're like, are y'all gonna pray with us? Like that's a priority for me. Mm-hmm. My daughter, who's seven, she's my my ex wife takes her to a private charter Muslim school. It's predominantly Muslim. And right. so, because Islam is an important thing for her. Sure, sure. If that's a priority, if you want your kid to be an alam, get him in tahfid from early. Uh, don't push him against his will. That's a whole other tangent. But put your kids in that situation. Give yeah. them the assets, the tools. How many celebrities, LeBron James went to a pr- premier basketball high school so that he could be trained to do what he's doing now. Yeah. Right. Uh, Michael Jordan, he had the, dr- the drive, so his family allowed to help him, or they put him in a situation that was good for him. Facilitation. Yeah. Facilitation. Something like spirituality, right? Like, I- I've been, like, trying to learn more like you know what we call tasawwuf mm. right that's something that i've been more exposed to in the last couple of years the mm-hmm. early part of my practicing the religion was more like the intellectual stuff that we were talking about mm-hmm. like you know just you've going talked hard about to, that numerously on air you know, <laughs> right <laughs> um do you think that looking back though i don't as a high school let's say i was in high school and i got introduced to tasawwuf you think it would make sense to me you think part of it i think part of it is just my life experiences now and like so one thing that always drives that always like resonates with me it's like now I know I'm getting old. Like mm-hmm. I like I feel I, I tell people all the time, like I'm thirty six years old. My condolences. And <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm on the wrong side of the hill. Like mm-hmm. like I'll be lucky like if I make it to seventy, I'm already halfway past, right? Mm. Like you see gray hairs popping up. I see see what blows my mind is when I see my four year old daughter who's gonna be five, and I remember being her age. Yeah. Like clearly. Yeah. Sure. And that's when I'm like you know, I'm getting old. So that, mm. so I feel like a lot of this awakening for myself is like just the, you seeing time just passing by like very fast. I, yeah. I remember, but I didn't get, I remember specifically when, when I realized I'm getting old is when my daughters introduced me to the, this, uh, dab. The dad. Yeah, no. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> What's going on with society that this stupid move is now a dance move? The bottle then, flip, the bottle flip. But hold on. What's worse about the dab is where it originally comes from. Yeah. It comes from vaping or no, it comes from dabbing, dabbing is taking is. the like the root or the juice from marijuana. I don't know what it is yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The extract. But yeah. The extract. It's so strong that you cough. Yeah. Really? So it's like <coughs> you're covering your face. Wow. God, I <laughs> everything has that. a connotation. Everything yeah. has Holy a weird cow. connotation. Yeah, 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 dude. But back to your your question about spirituality and kids. I'm not a it's like a scholar thing. Um like to teach a spirituality, but what I will say is that I think it depends on how we present it. Kids don't understand different things all the time. So, for example, um, I was talking to my kids the other day. And so my, my, my son is really fair skinned and my daughter is brown. And so they don't understand race, but they just see this is a poignant difference between them. So my son is like, Hannah, you're brown. Hannah, you're brown. He's like making fun of her. And I'm like, that's not cool, dude. You don't make fun of that. And he's like, but Baba, Hannah's brown. I was like, listen, they don't understand Allah fully yet. So I'm like, listen, there's no difference between her color or your color. What's most important is your adab. You have to have good adab. Oh. And some wife looks at me like, wait, I thought like it was taqwa. I was like, they don't understand taqwa yet. So we're talking about adab. <laughs> and I was like, if your adab is better than Baba's. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, if your adab is better than Baba's, mm-hmm. then 
you're going to be better than Baba. He's like, okay, got it, Baba. Like, yeah. And so you have that spirituality to a four-year-old. Yes, right. You're it's right. talking to him in a way that's Phenomenal. tangible for them. That's mm. hikmah. Mm. Yeah. Cool. yeah. I mean, what we do a lot of, uh, we do like a tafsir after Maghrib every, every day. So, um, you know, and then we do memorization along with the tafsir. So we're kind of memorizing some. But like, I know like my... When you go to through Juzuma and you're memorizing those surahs, mm-hmm. some of them are really powerful, right? Like mm-hmm. especially the, the verses regarding hellfire and things like that. Um, and, and I know, like my my younger two, they're uh, six, uh, seven, and eight mm-hmm. years old. They just start crying, mm-hmm. and they're just wow. overwhelmed with tears because wow. they they think they're going to go to hell. But then wow. I have to remind them about the hadith from the Sahaba who said, you know, all the Muslims are going to go to Jannah, and then they laugh about how uh, Omar Adiyah smacked the Sahaba who said that, and <laughs> they had a good laugh about it. You got to kind of calm them down, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you got to yeah. build them. Like, yeah. I, I at first I thought, like, am I just, like, overloading them? And then mm. I realized, like, okay, if you have these, and, and this is what I'm trying to tell a lot of parents who are, um, you know, raising kids that they got to get strong with the dean themselves. They got to be able to help their their kids. I know a lot of um, young parents might not have been able to handle that situation. Like, oh, wait, how do I uh, resolve this? Uh, these, you know, they're getting overcome with the emotions of uh, hellfire and things like that. And how would they have dealt with it if they didn't know? Totally. That, that, that can be even traumatic for a parent. Oh, my God, what did I do to my kids? Right. What did and I just the, do to them? Did you, I permanently scar to them? Maybe I shouldn't teach them, them the Quran anymore, yeah. right? Yeah, and then, happen. like, That's you got to... That's comes in I mean, folks, if you're listening out there who are parents, you guys, if, if you feel like you can't answer some of these questions, you guys got to go out there. And there's so many institutes and, and so many other... Find the people, <laughs> ...resources man. of learning. Best you can't just throw them at, at someone else and say, oh, you know, teach my kid. You got to be there them for them now from the beginning and then no no tarbia the, and cultivation and teaching ends up starts from day one right um i was with one of my teachers and he was like um we were talking about the hadith if teach them salah at seven then beat them at ten so someone's like yo why do you gotta beat your kids like you know blah blah he's like listen if you brought your kids up loving salah they won't need to be beat he's like my two-year-old prays now and she loves to pray <laughs> he's like but she's growing up seeing mom and baba praying and that's something a family does things stop everyone's quiet blah, blah blah and so that's really the spirit that you want to bring your kids up about your daughter you mentioned um she was listening to the verses of hell and it made her sad and scared yeah. i think everyone is predisposed to either or fear or hope and so whichever way you are then that's something you have to be careful of. You exactly. just have to balance that's, it. That's Everyone's a, different, though, because one daughter could be fearful. Another one's like super hopeful. Like, we're going to Jannah. That's all good. That's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, who, was it Ibn Khayyam who, who wrote the book or said between uh, faith lies between fear and hope? Uh, numerous uh, scholars. Yeah. yeah. Said that. So and I, th- I think that's what we were talking about as I was telling them, like, look, this this ayah says uh, well, it's talking about hellfire, and then the next eye is talking about Jannah. It's yeah. a balance, and, and, and it's always a balance throughout the, the book. And what's the main central theme throughout the Quran is the last day. Yeah. And that, that needs to be built into our brain. And it's a constant reminder that the last day is what we're, we're looking at. That's the end goal. And everything around it mm. is just a mirage. Yeah. Everything is just there to distract you from it. You're right. You're right. It and reminds me, your kid's crying reminds me of a, like, so I have a very, I told, when Imam Suhaib was on the show, I told him like, I have an all time favorite Imam Suhaib lecture. It's called, uh, Zina Disease of a Thousand Faces. It's hmm. on uh, aswatalislam.net. Aswatalislam. I forgot about that website. It's from <laughs> the know? 90s. So he, has a, <laughs> he quotes something. He narrates something from Hussein ibn Ali. Radiallahu an. When Hussein was a kid, like they were talking, like he was in a gathering where they're talking about the verses of the hellfire. And then Hussein was crying. And they're like, Hussein, why are you crying? You're so young. He's like, well, I was thinking about like the, the, the wood in the hellfire, the big pieces. In the, and then he's like, there's little pieces. And I was worried that as a young boy, I might be one of the little pieces. Allah, Allah, wow. Right. I was like, yeah, you know, and so it's like you, I guess it's important to have that realization at the same time, it right? Is, no. Is. But I have the balance as, as Abdul Malik was teaching. saying. Right. You're, you're instilling a, a <laughs> I remember as a kid one time I was in Jersey and we went to Eid 
And his dad came to Eid with his tobe on. He had his belt around his neck. I'm like, dang, what's going on? He had little two sons with him. And so one of the brothers was like, actually, like, why the heck do you have a belt around your neck? And he said, they don't know who God is. So until they learn to fear, a lot of them going to fear this belt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Real quick here, before, uh, I, I want to I start wrapping this up soon. Um, really? <laughs> You're going to make Abraham our fan, super fan, really mad. I didn't give you any indication to no that. um but uh ibrahim who ibrahim man ibrahim our our, our guy from uh, louisiana louisiana oh. <laughs> new orleans oh wow well. i gotta do groceries today ibrahim <laughs> god bless you ibrahim. he'll be yeah. happy with the shout out I, I gotta i gotta do groceries and then i gotta go home and then i gotta come back for some like class at 8 30 <laughs> back in this side of town so um anyways like we talked about a little bit about podcasts you listen to when mm. you were in Saudi and stuff. Like yeah. we were just like, because you've known about us, I think for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but you seem like you're somebody who listens to podcasts. We usually don't get guests that like really? can talk about other podcasts. Mm. So like, talk about a little bit. You, you, like, what, what do you listen? What do you? By the way, sh- shout out to a lot of our Saudi students who are listening. Uh, there's a, we have a pretty decent sized following. I think it's a lot of the students who are studying overseas yeah. in Saudi. And, and I look at the numbers, I'm like, holy cow, they can't, that can't be Arabs who are listening to us. <laughs> it has to be our own students who are listening so over there. For me, the last two years, I was already transitioning out of Saudi, like mentally. Yeah. Um, and because I had a long commute to work, so it was like a half an hour to work, a half an hour, or a half an hour to school, a half an hour back home, then there's the day split up as a split shift. So you did, I went to school in the morning, worked at nighttime. And what kind of work if you don't? Can you I share? taught English. Okay, yeah, um, that's how most of us, especially in Mecca, we provide. So, you, so you know, the Muslim, I was teaching in, English too in Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, the Medina students would always say that they would do their like school at the Jamia during the day and then go to the Halakha Masjid Nabawi. Yeah. Did you guys have something similar where you go to the Haram? And- yeah, yeah, yeah. That was still a, a reality for most people. Halfway through my studies there, I got married. Okay. And um, that reality soon changed. I had to provide for a family. Um, so alhamdulillah, there were a few halaqas I was able to go to, but like that every day in the, in the haram type situation stopped. Um, so I had a long commute to school and to work. And so I would just listen to podcasts. So Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, um, was it Howell School of Greatness? Lewis, Lewis House. Um, Qalam had, uh, Muslim Matters, not Muslim Matters, Qalam has one, but more importantly, it was the, um, about finance. Um, oh, a Muslim Money Podcast. Yeah. Omar Osman's. Omar Osman's, exactly. Yeah, right. right. Um, but really, it was a lot of just consuming Tim Ferriss, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I remember you were posting that on uh, on Facebook. Yeah, and, yeah. And w- w- we had just recently become friends on Facebook at that point. And I said, hey, th- it's crazy that you listen to these podcasts because these are the podcasts that kind of inspired me yeah, yeah. to get into the Mad Mom Luke's because, wow. um, you know, Tim Ferriss was kind of, you know, pushing this... Um, new age uh, religion. Yeah, new age, not, not, yeah, he does that. And he's got a lot of these about the, motivators the, who are, you know, trying to get you involved and trying to get you to do things that are things that you'd normally thought you weren't capable of, right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like this whole new biohacking thing and right. how to, how to learn a language in right. this yeah, three yeah. days and how to learn how to swim. You know, this, I, that's how I really kind of gravitated. And, uh, he had this thing that I, I, I just found it really interesting of, how fighters cut weight and how they cut 25 pounds in, yeah. in two weeks. and yeah. the Slow-carb the, diet. Yeah, yeah slow-carb diet. I tried yeah. that for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how it worked. No. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to ask it because it didn't work yeah. for me. So for me, it was um, – so social media throughout my entire time in Saudi was my means of connecting to back home. Um, so if you actually – don't do this, but if you were to go back on my Facebook feed – I was posting everything. Like, I just got some ice cream today. Like, we went to Basket Robbins. <laughs> I went over here. Um, because that was my, like, my life. Um, that was your touch with the reality. Yeah, of the touch US. with the reality. And Saudi's a very tribal society. And so, being an expat, um, expatriate, we just, you didn't have a lot of friends. Um, so yeah, it's, um, podcasts were a means of, it was like, Supplemental education, almost you could say. So like Tim Ferriss, a lot of motivational stuff, a lot of hacking, cool. but a lot of business, entrepreneurial stuff. Yeah. Um. So that, I really love that. So were you friends with just main, mainly uh, American students there, or British no? Or? I had friends from everywhere. My oh, my cool. roommate was from Tajikistan. He married Mashallah. my wife's friend. Mashallah. Um, 
Uh, another roommate was Somali, Kenyan Somali, Belgi Belgium friends. One of my good, good, good friends is an Afghani, born and raised in Saudi. Um, so alhamdulillah, yeah, really diverse. You know, it was funny because Rogan, uh, he interviewed Khabib last night yeah. after the win. Did Khabib win? Yeah. 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 Allahu Akbar. He got the, he got yeah. the belt. So I don't Akbar. know anything about UFC, but I know, so you know Rogan, I stopped listening to him because every chance he gets is like, Islam gets a bad rap. He's a new age. He's, he's, you know he's what a mean? spokesperson for new age. He, it's people. like, except that one lady that... Uh, there was that one lady who was talking about Palestine and Israel. I forgot her name. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, oh, Aubrey, from um, uh, Aubrey, RT's. Aubrey uh, something. No, 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 Aubrey. It's, uh, she, she used to work for RT. I forgot her name. Yeah, yes, but anyways. Yes, yes. So that's Abby, only, Abby Martin. Abby, Abby Martin. Yeah, yeah so yeah. she like Abby went Martin. in on the hell. So she, you know, she like kind of gave it reality. But for the most part, he's got these people like Sam Harris and like yeah. Milo always talking about Islam. And he's always... Arian Foster challenged him a little bit. When he was on, yeah, and but Jordan like, Peterson challenged him too. Yeah, did he? I didn't listen to the poor Peterson. He doesn't talk in front of Jordan Peterson though. He's kind of afraid of Jordan. Okay, Peterson. I get that. But like, uh, it was just interesting to see how like Khabib is just saying Alhamdulillah. Like, no, not only that, time. he said there's only one God. He said it on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one God. He's looking right in Rogan's eyes. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love that part. Yeah, yeah. I, you know? I haven't even heard the podcast, but I know, Mashallah, Khabib is. He doesn't play. You know, no, we, no, we didn't have Khabib on the podcast. No, 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 no. I know, I know. Oh, okay. we, we will soon, inshallah. We will soon, inshallah. We will have him soon, inshallah. Yeah. You know, um, and to our fans too, pressure him, get onto his, uh, yeah. contact him, and tell him to come on the Mad Bum Luke's. He'll come on. Yeah, he's gonna get bombed. <laughs> he's gonna it, get it started with Abraham. Abraham. Oh, sorry, wrong use of <laughs> his <laughs> Twitter <laughs> feed is gonna be overflown. <laughs> <laughs> the Muslims can't use that word anymore. Yeah. Right, right. So, uh, Abdul Malik, before we wrap, anything else you want to add? You want anything you want to share with us? Uh, you know, sh first time. How long have you been? First time in Chicago. Yeah, it's been the first time since I was little. Yeah. Really? Mm hmm So uh what are you like how long are you here till? I'm here tomorrow afternoon, inshallah. Mm, okay. Yeah. And then so what have you seen so far? Nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the inside of Khalil Center and the hotel? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um we had the wellness conference yesterday and today it was like a lot of planning stuff and then yesterday I was like reading my email that Human sent me. I was like, wait. Mad Mam Luke's what? <laughs> like who signed me up for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I specifically asked for you when he I saw the schedule a few weeks back. Alhamdulillah. Any pizza for you today or no? Or yesterday? No, no pizza. Yeah, what, 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 Dude, yeah, you didn't have pizza. What, what kind of food are you into? I'm into food. <laughs> you don't have any deep dish pizza? No, I haven't had any. Ever in your life? No, I've had, of course. Oh, but in Chicago? Been, watch this, watch this. I've been to Uno's. Uh, Uno. oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Chicago, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, no. Uno's is like all over the country. It, it, that's true. There's Uno's in Ohio, right? Really, I'm Giordano's, sure. you, Giordano's, yeah, Giordano's yeah, or Sim likes Lou Malnati's. You know, yeah, Lou Malnati's. Is you know, I just it, like you know. I guess tomorrow is kind of tough. You should go. Yeah, I'm supposed tomorrow. to go out. Um, when are you leaving? To tomorrow evening. Oh, tomorrow. Can you meet up? Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll talk after the podcast. Yeah, we'll talk after the podcast. We'll have to, like, you know, we'll have to, like, give Humat some junk about not giving you the full Chicago trip. Man, I've had a <laughs> bunch of desi food, mashallah. Buttered chicken. And <laughs> Butter chicken. <laughs> I, I saw it when I walked in. Man, yeah, yeah. it's like every place you go, it's the same formula. Butter chicken, biryani, naan, maybe some other type Samosas. of chicken. <laughs> yeah. Other type of chicken. chicken yeah, I'm trying to think it's anything else. You can get some kebabs if you're lucky. Yeah, I don't know how the food scene in Boston is compared to Chicago. I don't know what Boston is known for, other than clam chowder <laughs> and like fish and Conor McGregor fans. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. We're not really big on. We're not. I don't. I don't know if we're like known for our food. Um, yeah, I, I, don't know. I know you guys got that one thing, clam bake, right? Where you put it all the the seafood on the table. I don't know. I'm in New England. I, like so they, disclaimer, I'm not from Boston officially, originally. Oh, so so you, I don't know. But, but you are living I'm a Bostonian now. You definitely got to do that, though. <laughs> you, it's like a, you get all the seafood in a bag, right? And then you put it on a table. Yeah. And it's all like spiced up and everything cooked and ready to go. Oh, wow. and, and the table is free of any dishes. And you could just use your hands. No and way. You just break open all the the crawfish and lobster or whatever you're eating. That sounds dope. And, and you just next time you come hands. to Boston, I'll let you take me in Charlotte. Heck, yeah. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. I've never, I've never been to Boston. I haven't either. Uh, Alan, Alan, we'd love to have you to ICBC in Charlotte. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to Philadelphia though in five for like, you. You, you, you ever lived in Philadelphia or no? No, I used it's, to go up frequently as a kid. You ever okay. been to Southie? Uh, Boston? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. All right, well, very cool. I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, how can people reach out to you? Uh, do you have a social media presence still, or nope. do you? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'd only add people on Facebook unless I've met you. Thank you. Uh, on Twitter, uh, I don't use it. It's just connected to Facebook, so I probably won't respond to you. If you really want to get in touch with me, you can go to our website isbcc.org and you can email me if I can serve you in any way. I'm, I would love to. 
but uh, I'm really just focused on Boston serving my community there. That's awesome. People send you questions, you answer questions once in a while. No, I don't answer questions. I get them to Sheikh Yasser and I okay. and get okay. him to answer cool. them for them. Nice. Awesome. Mashallah, and we'll like, we'll have to figure out a way to get Sheikh Yasser because we'd like to get Sheikh Yasser in the studio. Mm. We don't want to do a Skype business. Yeah, like, he's yeah. gonna be. Oh, it's not even in Chicago this year. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll, we'll make it we'll happen. Out. You guys should just come to Boston. Like this is this Yo, brother, like, you guys pay for the tickets and the hotels have, we're coming. We have bad ends up with our mashaykh. Like traditionally, we used to go travel a month's journey for one hadith. Like just come to you guys drive to Boston yeah. and we'll put you up at the masjid. Drive for the hadith. Just come for one lecture and then Bismillah, you go back. Yeah. Nah, man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was uh, nah, man. That, was, that was okay when you were put 20. my time in Azhar, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. If I, 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 you know, you put Sheikh Amaris Kibar to Sheikh Yasser. All due respect, Sheikh Amar. No, 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 no way, <laughs> Sheikh Yasser. You guys, I would just like. Well, the, he's, he's something else. I just had to put like, some respect to, on his name. Something else. Yeah, mashallah. All right, for our listeners out there, if you have questions or comments you can email us at the mad at gmail.com you can follow us on facebook like us on follow us on twitter uh give us more facebook likes we're on instagram um give us a five-star review on itunes um and subscribe one of the reasons i'm really trying to wrap this up is like i have really dry mouth i had a, i had like, <laughs> like, like two pounds of desi food <laughs> and i'm i need like more water and like i'm like parched right so <laughs> he's parched yeah had a, i keep gotta go to and stuff I'm, but anyways I'm, I'm, mashallah. good intro to our podcast. hey uh don't forget to subscribe on youtube all right uh make sure everyone has a youtube account you just go there you don't have to watch any videos just subscribe on it and um if we can get to a thousand we're pretty close um we might put some of these uh lectures or interviews or whatever you want to call it some of these podcasts on video for you guys nice cool. right cool all right for our special guest imam abdul malik merchant and my co-host sheikh hammer saeed and sim this is mahin signing off for the mad mamluks assalamu alaikum <laughs>